Hi, my name's Keith Cooper, and in this video today, I'm going to look at aspects of paper that you print photos on. Uh, media types, what some of these things mean, how they have different names with different printers, even if they're the same thing, and what you should think about if you're looking for a paper and looking for profiles with it, or if you're looking to make your own profiles. Now, I'll leave making your own profiles till a bit later because it covers a lot more information and a lot more technical aspects. But up front, if you are looking for a new photo paper to use with your printer, if you look at manufacturer's sites, look for ones that have profiles. If they have profiles, they should have with those profiles the recommended media settings to use on your particular printer. Remember, a profile is specific to a printer, a paper, the inks used, and you don't swap between them. And it's set for when it's created using a particular media type. Now, they should match what you see on your printer display when you, when you go to the driver and when you set things. So if your paper supplier doesn't offer profiles, then you know you're either going to have to do your own profiles because the printer is not widely supported, or you're going to have to find a paper supplier that does produce profiles. Now, some paper uh, suppliers, uh, certainly here in the UK, there are several, where if you buy some paper off them, you print out a target, a coloured target, you send it off to them and they will make you a profile. It's part of what they offer if you buy some of their paper. And they may well have profiles for more common printers available as well. And that's just you know, one of the reasons you might choose to use them. Quick thing on Epson and Canon papers. Uh, this is a pack of uh, photo paper, Pro Luster. They do. They tend to juggle the na the, the words up here uh, for different versions of them, so they're always tricky to read out. But photo paper, Pro Luster. It's a 260 gram paper. It helpfully tells me that it's 0.26 millimeters thick. Uh, Obviously, if you're working in inches and things and pounds, you will have to do the conversions for these. Uh, I work entirely in metric when I'm doing this sort of stuff. Uh, pound weight for paper is a tricky thing, only used in the US, and it's quite difficult to work out. Certainly, I would uh, stick to this, you know, bite the bullet, try something in metric for a change. Um, the calculations really are easier. But anyway, Epson paper, premium glossy photo paper. Now, this has been around for years. In fact, it says for use with the Epson Stylus Photo 1270. Um, that's at least 20 years, I think, that's since that printer has been commonly in use. I had a version of it, a 1290 I had, um, and I used that paper with it. It worked fine with it. It's a very good paper, a basic glossy paper. It works. People say to me, ah, I've got boxes and boxes of Epson paper, Canon paper, but I've just bought myself a Canon printer or an Epson printer. Are there profiles available? Well, I can easily tell you that one. No, Canon does not make profiles for using their papers on Epson printers. Likewise, Epson doesn't make profiles for using their papers on Canon printers. Nor does Canon make profiles of Epson papers on their printers. The two are quite distinct split. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have a huge great pile of Epson paper and you buy a Canon printer or vice versa, that you can't use those papers because the papers are actually fairly similar. And we do have to remember that neither Epson or Canon are particularly big in paper making. So uh, what you see here is a packet with Canon branding on it. Likewise, as you see, a packet with Epson branding. So don't think that just because you've used one paper, you can't use it on the other. If you want to print at high quality, though, you do have the, asp the difficulty of profiles. And this is one of those things where if you're, if you're going to use profiles, you're probably going to have to make your own profiles in that respect. Now, it's not difficult. I've covered it in lots of different videos and articles as well. Um, I tend to put more technical detail in the articles because I can fine tune them, reread them and check them to make sure they're absolutely right. Whereas the videos are just, you know, they are as they are. If you want to make the simplest way of making profiles is uh, this is a uh, CC Studio, used the old Color Monkey i1 Studio. 
um, you print this out, you measure these patches, you run some software, you do another print, you measure those, and you generate yourself an ICC profile. Now that profile will work on that printer, on a PC, on a Mac, it's just a general profile. So if you're in a camera club, for example, and you think, well, spending a few hundred quid on one of these devices is a bit expensive, find some other people in the camera club, uh, go for a, you know, a, a joint thing, buy it for the club or something like that. Make your own printer profiles. Uh, you'll find that uh, people get into it and uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting to do. And if you're careful about it, you can see a noticeable improvement on print quality. Now, you may not see much an improvement with you know, sort of consumer level equipment like this over the profiles that you get from Canon or from Epson to go with your printer, but not always. Sometimes your own profiles can look better. I, if not better, they may look different and they may look better to you. It's all about taste. There is a, um, and I know x right always used to do this when they used to go on about colour perfection. To my mind, there is no such thing as perfection. Colour management is nothing to do with perfection for me. Uh, colour management is about getting things right first time more often. In other words, when something goes wrong and I'm using colour management, it tells me almost certainly what I've done wrong. Um, modern printers are great, Canon Epson printers, um, I've got no problems with them. If I make a bad looking print, whether it's on a small Canon printer that I was looking at, or even this, this big Epson P5000 here, if I make a duff print on one of these, it's almost certainly my fault. And I have to admit that colour management helps me find ways around it. Anyway, that is how you would go about getting profiles. The media names that you see, the profile should have that. Let's say you've now got a paper that you want to make a profile for, that you're going to do some profiling yourself. You need a bit more knowledge about paper types and different aspects of that. Let's say I've got some Epson paper. I've got this Epson Premium Glossy Photo paper. Say I've got um, a shed full of it outside and I don't really want to buy any new paper perfectly reasonable, but I want to print an image or I want to, you know, I want to do some profiling and you print images to do the profiling. And I look at here and I've got a Canon Pro 200. Well, it's a basic glossy photo paper that will work just fine in the Canon Pro 200. Um, what paper do I use for my media type? Well, if I look at the list here, I have a huge, great list. I've got photo paper. And so once again, the names of these, they are just permutations of similar words. So if I get them wrong, you'll know why. Photo paper plus glossy 2A. What does that mean? Not a lot. Photo paper pro platinum. Photo paper pro luster. That's this one here. Now, this particular paper here is I shall say almost identical to the premium luster I might use when I'm testing an Epson printer. There's very little difference between it. We've got photo paper plus semi-gloss. Well, Epson do a semi-gloss paper as well. And we go through the various types here. You will see there is a broad match between the paper types here listed on the Canon driver and the ones that you'll be used to using on your Epson driver. And they, vice versa, if you've got vast great stocks of Canon paper, you want to use it in an Epson printer, same goes. You look for this, you look for what is similar. If you're unsure, you can always do two, uh, you know, do some tests. But if you've got shed loads full of the stuff and pl presumably plenty of ink as well, you can do lots and lots of tests and see which ones look the best. But just be careful in that actually spotting the differences can be very different. They yeah, are very difficult. Um, I use this, this test image here. Um, I've got this at different sizes. Test images are all available on the Norflight Images website. Um, I've got this test image here and I can print that on, let's say, uh, the Epson print glossy paper here. I can do it on a Canon glossy paper. And then apart from the fact that some of the papers conveniently have the name of who made the, who, who sold the paper on the back of them, so Epson or Canon written on the back of them, it's often very difficult to tell for basic papers like that. Uh, what about if I'm deciding, well, this, I'm actually going to look at something a bit more high quality. Well, the choice is what you've got. How do I identify an unknown paper? Well, there are 
a paper should never be totally unknown. You should have clues as to where you got it from, what box it was in. Now, I've been testing papers long enough that if I get a roll of paper, a roll paper in a box and open it up, I can have a pretty good idea of who made it just by the colour of tape that it's wrapped up with. It really is that obvious once you, once you know some things uh, about these. So if I open up a box of paper and it has like a light sort of silver, thin silvery paper on the top of it, that's a big clue. Um, I'm thinking, oh, is this a Hannah Muller paper, for example? Different different manufacturers have different styles of packaging. But you only really pick that up if you do lots of paper. Um, I have a fairly good knowledge of paper, but if I really want a deep understanding of paper, I go and see my mate Chris at Paper Spectrum here in Leicester. Um, I can just show him a paper and he'll just go like this and tell me who made it, um, who made it, whose brand it is, because remember, what it says on the box is not the same necessarily as the person who was the business that made the paper or made the paper or even coated it. So I've got some fairly obvious things I can tell. So this is a thick matte paper. It's a probably, by the looks of it, it's a lightly textured paper. Um, it's probably a cotton rag paper. Now I can measure the thickness. I've got a gauge here, I can measure the thickness. I can work out the weight in grams by measuring on a scale, say 10 sheets of it, measuring it, divide by 10, or measuring it, working out the area and doing the calculations that way. So I can quite easily take an unknown paper and I did have one which I thought was probably um, a Hannah Muller paper at 265 gram. I weighed loads of sheets of it. I know the size of an A3 plus sheet, uh, did the calculations and I came up with something like 263 grams. Well, that's close enough. Um, you know, it's, if it's close enough to 265, that tells me what it is. Now, I've got a big list of papers that I've reviewed over the last years, which I'll put a link to in the notes for this video. Big long list of papers which you can look at. And I've got as many of the specs as possible there. Because remember, weight grams per meter squared is one thing, but that is not the same as thickness. Thickness and grams vary depending on the density of the paper. Now this paper is quite a thick but relatively light cotton rag paper. If I look at a different paper, one here, this is uh, a glossy print. I can tell by looking at the surface texture, it's a luster. So if, if you gave me this as a mystery paper to profile on a new printer, I would profile it on an Epson printer as premium luster. I wouldn't bother with the Premium Luster 260 or anything. I'd just go for out and out Premium Luster. And likewise, if I was doing it on a Canon one here, I'd go for, where are we? Photo Paper Pro Luster. And that's what I would do for my profiling. Um, there are other settings there that may be more appropriate to the paper. But I've managed to identify the type of paper. Is it on a paper substrate? such many Barita type papers, or is it on what looks like a, a resin, um, a coated plasticky type paper? Um, all different types of papers, they give you different, different feels to them. You've got the surface texture. So for example, and surface color. So we have a paper here, and I say this one's a cotton rag paper. I have not written on the back of it, so I cannot tell you which printer this A3 Plus black and white print was made on. Um, it's obviously one of my test prints, doing a borderless one, and I have no idea what it is. I could measure it, I could do a few things. It's a slightly warm finish. Look at the colour, look at the colour in daylight, look at it under artificial light. If it looks very bright in daylight, you know it's got optical brightness. Uh, all these different things make a slight difference to the paper. But when it comes down to it, if I'm profiling this paper, oh, that's an Epson uh, P5000 there. Let's say this is a, a mystery paper. I will measure the thickness, work out the grams. may give me a clue as to what it is. But when it comes to profiling, for a media setting, I'm going to start off with either ultra smooth fine art or maybe velvet fine art. There are two basic settings on an Epson for, a, for a, um, an art paper like this. You get more and more settings as the printers get better. 
Um, they often have ones, they'll have a baryta setting or whatever. Uh, many of those settings are actually nothing to do with the coating of the paper and how the ink goes onto it. They're to do with the thickness and they're to do with how the paper is fed through. Uh, so don't think that just because the settings are slightly different for a paper that it's actually going to look very different in a print. It's really just to make sure that the print goes through, you don't get head strikes and other things like that. So you've got all these various different bits and pieces. You've got all the, you've got um, you've got all the details on the texture. You've got the color, the base that it's on, the weight, and from that you should be able to get a good idea. Now, site manufacturers, I would suggest having a look at. My first choice would be go and have a look at the range from Innova. Now, Innova papers I've used for years. Um, they make papers. Their papers are made for other people as well. Um, they are a very successful paper company. Look through their IFA range of papers and see if you can find something similar to what you're working with. Uh, they are great papers on the, in their own right as well. Next, have a look for company, and these are these are UK ones. Um, the only company I know much of in the US is Red River, and they're they're fairly good. Uh, they've got lots of technical information. They do lots of testing on stuff, but I would say they still sell papers in pounds weight. Great for their market, doesn't actually mean much over here, uh, irrespective of how good the papers are and things. But they've got they've got data on it there. Have a look at here in the UK, Permajet. Um, I've worked with quite a few times over the years. Likewise with Photospeed and I said the local paper uh, supplier here, and I mean, it's literally you know, within cycling distance, is Paper Spectrum here in Leicester. Now Paper Spectrum is where I got quite a few of these cards from. Um, these are greetings cards. This is on a rag type paper. Um, I could probably find out what it was. If I actually went into the place and asked, you know, they'd be able to tell me in a moment as to what that, what that particular the media was. But say, look at those, the, the manufacturer's sites, look at the data they give, and the data are not always precisely compatible, so you may need to do a bit of understanding and delve beneath it. Um, have a look as well at the index of all the papers I've reviewed over the years. There are quite a lot of them, and I've got some new ones to add to that uh, coming up. But have a look at those and they will give you all the details. Just one little warning before I finish off on this, and I hope it's useful, but please do ask questions if you've got any, but I say one little warning. Various things like the parameters here, you think, well, 260 gram, it is 260 gram. Well, these numbers you see on the outside of a packet are marketing collateral. Specifications can have a little bit of drift. Let's say I'm ordering a paper to sell. I've got, I've got the boxes under, you know, Keith's Wizzy Paper brand. Um, yeah, and I'm going to sell this and it's 265 gram. And I think, well, I don't want 265 gram, 26. Don't want 260. Loads of people have got 260. I'll have 270 gram. Um, there is a certain specification drift sometimes in some, um, I call it marketing drift. Um, it means that you take figures that you read on the outside here and on websites as general indications of the correct values. Um, that is less so with the likes of, you know, sort of the likes of Innova who actually do the, the paper making. And I have several rolls of uh, some new Innova papers to try out on the P5000. So I'm going to be doing quite a bit of testing of new papers with the P5000 there, I'm going to look at the profiling, I'm going to look at how I decide on media settings and various things like that. But anyway, this is just the gist of it, of how the names and things go together, and hopefully that clarifies things a little bit. But there is one bit here, sitting over the back here. I have my pa packet of Paper Max inkjet. Now this Creative Glossy, I believe it's called, yes, Creative Glossy Paper. This paper, I keep this as an example of what happens if you just go out and buy cheap unbranded copy paper or uh, photo paper. This has a lovely shiny finish to it and not one printer I've ever used does the ink dry properly on it. Um, 
You simply cannot print on this stuff on a normal inkjet printer. Um, it was produced, there were printers 15 years ago that took this paper and produced images on it. But I keep it just as an example, just to show that sometimes when you're doing testing, you just have to go, no, this paper is no good for this printer. So if you've got lots of papers and you get yourself a new printer, then hopefully you'll be able to use those papers. But ideally you choose the paper after you choose the printer. If you've got a shed load full of this stuff and you get any modern Canon or Epson printer, you are still going to have a shed load full of this stuff until you can find somebody else to palm it off on. But anyway, I will leave it at that and I hope that's useful. As I say, do ask questions on it because this can be quite a complex subject and um, I hope I've clarified it a little bit for you. So thanks for watching and please do subscribe to the channel.